Okay, today's class is dedicated in honor of Rabbi Yitzchak ben Esther for Rafur Shleiman or Rafur Kreva, a complete and speedy recovery and Arichis Yamim for Shanam Tovis with all the blessings, but Tov Nigla. Thank you very much. And a complete recovery at a four krova. The first parsha that we read this week is Parsha's Chukas. Uh, as I said last week, in Yiddishkeit, entire names are very crucial because they capture the inner theme of the person or the parsha or the thing or the idea that is given the name. As it says in Svarim, that the channels of energy come through a name. The tr- same is true with the name of a portion, chukas. The word chukas, as commentators explain, is the concept of a chayk, which means a law, a statue, but a specific... Oh, yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a specific type of, of, of law... Which has an element of mystery to it, or maybe much of it is mysterious. And I find it very powerful that this is the name of the parsha, because essentially the week is a week of mystery. It's a week of chukas. It's a portion filled with mystery. It's named, of course, after the opening mitzvah of the parsha, which is a most confounding mystery in Judaism, that even Shleimah HaMelech, considered the wisest of all people, said, Amarti achakma vihi I said to myself, I was a wise person, and yet this remained distant from me. And he was referring to the mysteries of the Pora Aduma, of the red heifer which purifies a human being or a vessel that was contaminated by contact with death. So even Shleimah HaMelech, you know, throws up his hands and feels that he can't really master the depth of this mitzvah of this ritual because ashes of a red cow mixed with spring water and uh, a hyssop a hyssop plant that's used to sprinkle it on the person what is the real meaning of this so the medrash says on it zois chuka satayra chuka chakakti chuka chakakti means i decreed a decree the word chakakti is also engraving, like lachkoik. In other words, logic will not lead me to my destination here. Because cerebral analysis has its place, and has its virtues, of course, and has a, is a tremendous gift. But also, it has its limits. Some things are mysteries. But as you continue the parsha, the mysteries only become stronger and deeper, which would explain, of course, why Parah Duma made its way into the beginning of Chukas. Really, the laws of cleansing and purity and impurity are all in Sefer Vayikra. So you would expect the laws of Parah Duma also to be in Sefer Vayikra, particularly in Parshas Emer or Tazriya, Metzairah. That, that's with the Parshas of purity and impurity. But this exists in Parshas Chukas. The answer is, because it, become, it comes as a prelude to everything that happens after that. Right after the story of Parah Duma, Miriam passes away. After that, there's the story of Moshe and Aaron, who will experience a decree that they too will pass away in the desert after Miriam, and they also won't go into Eretz Yisrael. So we encounter yet a greater mystery, Miriam's death, and then we encounter the greatest mystery of all, and that is the story of Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron and the rock. So let's remember the context. Miriam, Moshe's older sister, passed away. As long as she lived, the Jews had water. They drank from a miraculous well that gave forth water in her merit. We call it Be'erish al Miriam. Now the water has dried up. The people are thirsty. They gather around Moshe and Aaron. They clamor to Moshe and Aaron, asking them to irrigate them. They need water to drink for themselves and, of course, their children and their livestock. Moshe and Aaron turn to Hashem for direction. When you're reading the story, it seems like a very sweet story. It's deja vu all over again, as they say. 
In the desert, it's not the first time they're missing water or they're missing food or they're missing something else. They come to Moshe, they complain, they lament. Moshe goes to, his, to the Creator and there's a solution. And what do they say? All is well that ends well. This seems like one of those stories that's going to end very well. But suddenly it takes a very strange turn, and I use the word mysterious turn. So if you look in your source sheets, if you didn't get a source sheet, there's more on the Bima. It's one page. You will have here the story in Parshas Chukas, Perik Chaf, beginning with Pasig Vav. That's Bamidbar, chapter 20, beginning with verse 6 through 13. Not many verses, but it contains probably the most, or one of the most mysterious stories in Chumash. So the people are begging for water, they're pleading for water, they don't want to die in the desert. There's obviously no natural sources of water in this wilderness. So what happens? So Moshe and Ara go away from the congregation, they go to the door, to the entrance of the Ayal Mayad, of the Mishkan, of the sanctuary. They fall on their face, Hashem's glory appears to them. Hashem tells Moshe, Take the staff, gather the people, gather the community, you and Aaron, your brother, and in front of them speak to the rock and it will yield water. It will produce its water and you will bring forth for them water from the rock for them and all of their animals, all of their livestock. Moshe indeed takes the stick from Hashem as he commanded. They gather the people to the rock and they say, Listen, O rebels, shall we bring forth water from this rock? Moshe raises his hand, he strikes the rock twice with his stick, and the water gushes forth in abundance, and everyone drinks. The people drink, and the animals drink, the beasts drink, everybody drinks. At this point, it seems like a very beautiful story, <laughs> doesn't it? I'm laughing just because how strange it is. If, if you would stop here, you wouldn't read anymore. It's a very beautiful story. Everybody was thirsty. Miriam passed away. There was no more water. You would think we would have a colossal tragedy of a few million people dying from thirst. Hashem once again comes through, through Moshe Rabbeinu, and the stick somehow strikes a rock, and water comes out, Mayim Rabbim, in abundance. There's no shortage, nobody has to fight for it, nobody has to clamor for it. There's absolutely no shortage of any water, and everyone is satisfied. The animals have enough to drink. Lahavda, the human beings have enough to drink. Altus Git, everything is perfect. It was a grand miracle. You could take sticks from today till tomorrow and strike as many rocks as you want, I don't think you'll produce water, and even if you'll somehow find a rock that has a few drops of water, I don't know how you're going to produce water for a few million people. What happens next shocked everybody. Until today we read it and we scratch our heads. What's the next scene? Hashem responds very differently. He says, since, since, you did not believe in me to sanctify me before the eyes of all of the Jewish people. You will not bring them into the land that I have given to them. And the Torah concludes the story, like as a postscript, as a summation. These are called the waters of Meriva, the waters of quarreling, the waters of fighting. Meriva is like a fight. The waters of fight with which the Jewish people are fighting with God, and he was sanctified through them. And that's the end of the story. Indeed, later in Parshas Chukas, Aaron will pass away, as Hashem told Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu will actually pass away only at the end of Chumash, but the decree for him to die happens in Parshas Chukas. So from the mystery of the red heifer, we get to the death of Miriam, and then to the story of the rock, and to the death of Aaron. So indeed, it's a Parsha of mystery. But the question we want to address today is the famous question. Everything seems good. The people needed water. Moshe gave them water. The people are happy. It's the end of the story. But apparently something terrible has happened. The weather has changed abruptly. 
And Moshe and Aaron are denied the privilege they yearned for their entire life, which is to go into the Promised Land. In fact, the objective of taking the Jews out of Egypt initially was to go into Eretz Yisrael and to establish a society, as Hashem envisioned, in Eretz Yisrael. So for Moshe Rabbeinu, this was not just a small punishment. It was a colossal disappointment, which really denied him from something he was yearning and pining for for 40 years, to the point that we see that he does not cease to plead and pray for the annulment of this decree. Later in Parshas Ve'eschanan, he will say, Ve'eschanan al Hashem, I pleaded with Hashem to allow me to go in. And Chazal say, Ve'eschanan is the numerology of 515, that he composed 515 tefillahs, prayers, just to go into his soul, to the point that Hashem said, stop already. <laughs> Ravlach, stop, stop, don't talk to me about this anymore. And until the last moment, he would not stop. Right. Even if there was something wrong that happened here, the punishment seems so disproportionate. Usually the concept of a punishment is proportionate with an action. Everybody understands that. And here it seems so out of the blue. It's like you're not expecting this. Like there's other stories with Moshe here. Suddenly, boom, he, st- he struck the rock. Water came out. Okay, you're not going into Eretz Yisrael. It, it, it's so strange that when you read it on a literal level, you're just scratching your head like, what happened? What is going on? What's the connection with going into Eretz Yisrael, not going into Eretz Yisrael? Uh-huh. There were so many interpretations given to this story that I once saw a commentator. His name is Shmuel David Lutzato, and he writes, he says, Paul Moshe Rabbeinu. Because every commentator gives another explanation for what he did. So he says he did one sin, but if you read the commentators, he did like 13 of them. Because everybody has a different interpretation. Rashi has his explanation, the Ramban has his explanation. Rachaim has his explanation, the Rambam has his explanation. <laughs> Kleyakar has his explanation, the Sepharnu has his, has his explanation. The Abar has every Mephoirish has another explanation. Let's say for Shari Aaron, he collected 25 different sins <laughs> that Moshe Rabbeinu did according to different Mepharshim. And the truth is, if you gather all the explanations that have been said on this, you will probably find a few hundred different explanations. So this man says, poor Moshe, he made one mistake and it became 500 mistakes because everyone doesn't know what the mistake is. So they impose another mistake on him. <laughs> it's fascinating, right? God, man did one thing, whatever that thing is, Nobody knows what it is. Everybody has to find another explanation. This one says Moshe got angry. This one says Moshe called the Jews rebels. Rashi says he, he hit the rock and didn't speak to the rock. The Ma- Barbanel says it wasn't about this. It was about sending the spies. This was just uh, <laughs> this was just like you know a pretext, a cover up. Everyone has a different interpretation. Huh? Oh, that's why it's in Chukas. <laughs> Very good. That's what I'm getting at. That's what I'm getting at. That was the, the introduction I was giving to the class was part of this. It wasn't just stop. That's why it's really in Chukas. It's really in Chukas, and the name is Chukas, because just like the Parah Aduma, even Shloim HaMelech said, Amarti Yachakma, I tried to understand, every part of Parsha's Chukas is part of that mystery. It's part of the Parah Aduma mystery, which has to do with death, of course. Paraduma is all about death. It's the concept of cleansing a person from contact with death. But what does that mean on a deeper level? It's not just a technical thing. Somebody touched a corpse and they're tame. So if I'm a Kayan, I can't eat holy food. If I'm a Yisrael, I can't go into the Beis HaMikdash. I can't eat Karbanas. That's all true, of course. But it's also the concept of contact with death. Not just physically, emotionally, psychologically. Can a person be purified after they contact, they have contact with death? In simple English, is there recovery after loss? Is there healing after loss? So we say life goes on, life has to go on, what should we do? But the question is, can it never be the same? Is there real Tara? Of course people move on and you know we have to live and eat and breathe and wake up in the morning. But the question is, you know, at what price? What does it do to a person? How does one deal with it? How does one react to it? How does one recover from loss? That's the question of Paraduma. It's not just 
a ritualistic question about sprinkling the ashes in the water. What is the mechanism in the Bria in creation and in Torah to be able to heal from such pain, from such loss, especially when it's so mysterious and unfathomable. And after thousands of years of explanations, everybody knows there's no settling information that you hear and say, ah, geschmack, ah, mechaya. With all the insights and beautiful insights and powerful insights and deep insights, there remains an element of chukas, of mystery. There's something mysterious about pain. And Moshe Rabbeinu's story with the rock goes right into that category because it actually touches the core of what happens with Paraduma. And what we want to explore today, other years we, did, we spoke about this story from different angles and different perspectives because there's, the story has so many layers and different interpretations. And like everything in Torah, they're all true. You know, Shivan Panam La Torah, there's 70 faces to the Torah and every face is a real face, but it's a different face. And the Rizal says that every Pasuk has 600,000 different interpretations. And that's in Pshat and in Remez and in Drush and in Sod. So figure out. That's a few million interpretations because he says every soul has its own interpretation. And there's 600,000 souls. So they're not contradictory to each other. It's just the fact that, you know, from the source of light, there are many different frequencies of light and they're all authentic. Today we want to explore one aspect and as we will see as it turns out Moshe didn't lose the plot the Rabbi Nishalelem didn't lose the plot but rather Moshe knew exactly what Moshe knew exactly what he was doing Hashem knew exactly what he was doing when Moshe hit the rock and didn't speak to the rock Hashem said speak to the rock he hit the rock he was initiating a shift, a shift in consciousness, a shift in history, a shift in paradigm, a new direction for the Jewish people and for history. And Hashem's decision was not a punishment as we would use it, a punishment, you didn't listen to me, and I'm going to penalize you so that everybody learns a lesson and that you learn a lesson, but rather it was a consequence of the reality that Moshe introduced at that moment. In order to appreciate this, Let's study a piece of Zohar which says something very strange about this whole story and it right away shows us a different dimension to the story. I just have to say one thing. At the end of this class, it's all still going to remain a mystery. But, so why am I giving a class? I could have just said it's a mystery. You'll see why. Okay. <laughs> One of the 600,000 interpretations, yes. But, 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 a, but a very profound one. I find a very profound one. So you see your second source, Tikkunei Zoyar Tikkun Chaf Aleph. Tikkunei Zoyar is a sefer that is exclusively written as a commentary on one word, Bereshus. It has 70 different interpretations on the word Bereshus. Because Bereshus has many different configurations. It's a big sefer. It's a whole section of Zoyar. And each interpretation occupies many pages. So this is Tikkun Chaf Aleph. In the middle of the 21st interpretation on Bereshus. There's a sefer called Megala Amukais. We're going to just quote him soon. He wrote a sefer, a huge, a very thick book on the word Va'eschanan. On the word Va'eschanan. I believe 176 or so interpretations of Vaschana. And each one is a whole interpretation. So it's the beginning of 600,000. So let's see what the Zayar says. I'm going to translate. Imla de Machabe. If Moshe would have not struck the rock, Macha in Aramaic is strike, hit. None of the Jews and none of the Tanoim, none of them, none of the Talmudic sages would have to toil in the study of Torah, which is compared to a rock. Hashem said, speak to the rock, and it's just going to flow, the water is going to flow without exertion, without tircha, without bother. Speak to the rock, rock representing 
the Torah, that's what the Zoyer says, Venosan Meimov, that's the word, Venosan. Hashem said it will give its water, it will give like when you give freely, benevolently, generously, with ease, without a burden, without intensity, without complexity, without tercha. It says there'll be a day nobody will teach anybody else. Because everybody will know from small to great, from small to big, young to old. The Nova Yirmiya says in chapter 31, Nobody will have to teach anybody. Because everyone will have intuitively and uh, instinctively and deeply the ultimate knowledge, the ultimate awareness. The water would come out without questions, without debates. Imagine Jewish life, what Jewish life would look like. No questions. What are we going to do all day? No machloikas, no disputes, and therefore no need for verdicts. Begin the shchinta the itmar b'haloi koi dvarai ka'esh nuum Hashem have a shari b'pumei in the Yisrael. The pasuk says in Yirmi also Yirmi chapter twenty three. My words are like fire haloi koi dvarai ka'esh nuum Hashem. My words are like fire. Hashem says, and then he continues kepatish yefoites sela like a hammer which splinters a rock. But in the beginning, my words are like fire, and this would have been in the mouth of all the Jewish people. The e oiraisa the balpa. My words refer to the oral Torah. The ihi sela al samach the inun shitin mesichtes da achi ihu sela al samach. The word sela is a combination of two words. Samach, samach is sixty, and all in Aramaic means to enter, to go in. So sela is al samach. There are sixty mesichtes. There are sixty tractates in Shas. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi who edited Torah Shabbat for the first time. Till his time, nothing was really written down. People could take notes, but the tradition of Torah was given over verbally and orally from teachers to students. You had the text of Tanakh, but that was it. That was it. So the, the, the transmission of Judaism was all live. It was master to teacher. What, what that did was, it did a few amazing things. Number one, there was an interaction between teachers and students that was essential because without that live interaction there was nothing left there were no books there were no texts it also gave responsibility to the teacher and the student on another level because i knew that if i don't transmit it it's all going to be forgotten if i'm a teacher i am a student it also allowed people to ask all their questions books now i have to struggle with the text but if my teacher is there i could speak to him so that's Torah Shabbat Peri. Yehuda Hanasi was the first one to put it on paper. This is in the second century after the Kamen Era, around 150 years after the destruction of the Second Mesa Mikdash, because he realized that the Jewish people are not in a position where they're going to be able to maintain that type of pedagogical communication. Because the dispersion was so dramatic and so intense and so fast, so that, that fabric that essential makeup of Jewish civilization is disintegrating and we're going to be left with nothing. So he decided, let's better have it on the text. The Gemara says on this that he employed the Pasuk, Eis Lasa Is Lashem, Heiferu Torah Secha. Sometimes you have to do something for God and annul the Torah. Because Hashem says, you're not supposed to write down Torah Shabbal Peh. But Rabbi Yudan Nasi said, I'm going to disobey in order to write it down. And he wrote down the Mishnah. And it's basically 60 tractates. He made it into six sections. Zroyim, Mayad, Nashim, Nezik, and Kachim, Taras. Zroyim is agriculture. Mayad is times, anything connected to time. Nashim is anything connected to relationships, marriages, etc. Nezikin are civil damages Kach and relationships between people, civil law, you know, partners, damages, neighbors, etc., business issues. And then you have Kachim, which are all the laws of Karbonis and of food. And Taharais, which are the laws of purity and impurity. Those six sections, each one contains many tractates. Together, Samach Masechtas. So, all Samach means to go into the 60. So, this rock was supposed to give its water freely. But then Moshe Rabbeinu hit the rock. And the Zoyar says everything changed. Now the water is not coming out freely anymore. Now you have to extract the water. Now there's debates. What does the water mean? You say, this is the water. I say, this is the water. You say, this is kerosene. I say, it's water. You say, it's dirty water. I say, it's clean water. The water is not coming out easily. That's why when Moshe hits the rock, it says, Vayetsu mayim rabim. It doesn't even nosan meim bav. It will give its water. Water came out in its, in its intensity. 
This also fits with the next source. The Gemara says about Bakama, page 82. The Navi Yeshaya says, Whoa, everyone who's thirsty, go drink water. What is he referring to? We need Isaiah the prophet to tell us that if we're thirsty, we should drink water. <laughs> is that what Yeshaya and Navi really people didn't know that when they're thirsty, they should drink water? <clears throat> It's like, you know, when a woman tells her husband, you know, I'm so hungry. And he says, so go eat. You think your wife doesn't know that when she's hungry, she's supposed to eat? Like, I'm thirsty, so go drink. Wow, that's brilliant. You should get the Nobel Prize for that. Gezai Masber, that is not the issue. I know that I have to eat. That's not the issue. What the issue is, I don't know. But, ah, now you sound like, uh, I hear you. So what's what Hoichal Tzami Lechul Amayim? So the Gemara says, Ein Mayim El Atayr. Dari Shir Shuma said, Yeshaya Navi is using Mayim as a metaphor. So here we see it also in the Zoyar. The water coming out of the rock. Sel Ayin is the water of Torah. Hashem told him, speak to the rock. And Moshe Rabbeinu struck the rock. So all Machloikas comes from that moment. And all the toil and exertion to understand what it means. Layers and layers and layers like a rock. Layers and layers, exterior, interior, happens at that moment. Now, this explains another fascinating thing. And that is, if you look in your next source, it comes from Yalkut Shemoni, which is the Medrash. It says, Hashem told Moshe, speak to the rock and teach on it one chapter of Torah and it will bring forth water. What does it mean teach one chapter of Torah? Which chapter was offered what its basic laws were? Why do we say that before davening? So the Beis Yosef writes in Arachayim Simenon, he quotes the Ra. The reason is because it's the one chapter in Mishnah that has no arguments. One chapter that has no debates. You read Ezel Mekayim, and usually every chapter in Mishnah is already the first one. There's a debate. Chachamim, Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Gamliel. Every, there's always debates. That's one chapter that the tradition from Moshe came clearly down through the generations. Nobody had any argument. So before we start davening, <laughs> we say that chapter. It's fascinating. So he says, that's Shnei Alav Perik Echad. Read that one chapter of Ezel Mekaimon, which has no machlaikas. Because as Desire says, if he would have spoke to the rock, it would have just given out the water. Yet what happened? Dvarai Ka'esh. Hashem says, my words are like fire. The Pasuk continues, Kepatesh Yefoyt Seitzela. Like a hammer which splinters a rock when Moshe took his stick and he struck the rock, water came out. A lot of water came out. But it's like the rock was splintered into different dimensions. So it's like sparks go out from all the places. In fact, the Megala Amukas writes, Reb Nassim Shapiro, that Patish is the same gematria like Mata Moshe. The stick of Moshe is the same numerical value, like the word Patish, which means a hammer. Kepatish, the Pasuk says there, like Kait Varekesh, Kepatish, that was like a hammer. You fight it, Sela. It splinters the rock and the water comes out from different directions and different layers. And therefore, there is machloikas, there's arguments, and the main thing is there is toil, there's exertion. It's not easy to, to access it all. This explains why the Torah says, Hema me meriva. It's the waters of fighting. Why is it the waters of fighting? There was no fight here. You say, well, the Jews complained about water. Okay, they complained about water, they complained about everything. They still complain. People complain. Why, is, why are these waters called me meriva, the waters of quarreling? There was no huge fight here. They complained. Moshe went to the Mishkan. Hashem told them what to do. But that's the name, Mei Meriva. The answer is because these waters caused the whole concept of Meriva. They were the waters that created a lack of clarity. And therefore, there is debates. There are disputes. Like the Zayar says, there's Machlaikas. There's Tech. I have to exert myself to find the meaning, to find the depth. And there's so many different perspectives and different issues. It's a, different, it's a different type of sela. In fact, there's a fascinating and very mysterious interpretation in the Zoyar. Hashem told him to speak to the rock. It says, Moshe struck the rock pa'amayim, twice. Like we just learned, Vayach Moshe, Vayach Sasel of Mateo pa'amayim, twice. So the first time didn't work. 
So there was striking, and there was more striking. And in Pehillim it says, Hein hikad sur vayazuvu mayim, vayazuvu. The word is vayazuvu. So the Medrash says, the Zarya says, Ein ziva el adam. We have in Chumash a zav and a ziva. A zava, it's a form of, of, of blood that gets emitted. It's different than, there's dam nida and dam ziva. You have to know how to distinguish today. We have a hard time distinguishing. But in Allah, it's like, vayazuvu mayim. So he says, the first time he struck, blood came out of the rock. Which only, only extends and expands the mystery. Where does blood come into here? What is the Zayar teaching us? And of course the big question is, why would Moshe do any of this? We all know that people have different temptations. I never heard of a temptation. Instead of speaking to a rock, you're going to hit a rock. It's like, no, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm going to hit the rock. Besides, between you and me, I think that hitting a rock and producing water is as miraculous as speaking to a rock and hitting water. <laughs> producing water, it's maybe a little harder. <laughs> But it's also a very, it's a, it's, a grand, it's a grand miracle. If water, if water represents wisdom and inspiration, and the Jewish people come to Moshe and they're asking him for water. They're asking him for physical water, but they're asking him, as the Gemara says also, for spiritual water, emotional water, psychological water. Water is the staple of life. We begin our existence in water, nourished in water. Every fetus develops, I don't know if to elaborate about this in this class, but every fetus develops in an amniotic sac, submerged in a mikveh, submerged in water for nine months. Our bodies can't live without water. Our world, our earth can't live without water. In fact, water constitutes 70% of the total mass of every cell. So if you have trillions of cells in your body, and you do, probably between 50 and 100 trillion cells, 70% of the mass of each and every cell consists of water, right? We have some scientists here in the audience. Did I get my numbers right? I believe that's what it is. In fact, I think it's around 65% of our body that is made up of water. It's around 70% of water that covers the surface of the earth, right? Like Chazal say, two-thirds water and one third dry land so water is not just a nice thing it's essential to life nobody and uh, nothing can live without water not an animal and not a human being and not a plant every we, we all depend and live on water everybody needs water again there's physical water but everybody also needs water a person needs inspiration wisdom uh, perspective enlightenment, uh, and water is fresh, water is alive. In the Parah Duma we have Mayim Chayim, there's different types of water, you know, there's water of life, living water. And that's why when Rabbi Akiva was confronted by the person who told him, why are you teaching Torah? During the times of the Roman edict not to teach, Rabbi Akiva's famous metaphor in Tractate Brachas, page 61, is the fish in the water. The fox who was hungry and he told the fish to come out of the water and the fox and the fish said, they say you're smart, I don't know how, but this is ridiculous, we barely, we, 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 we are so threatened inside of the water from all the fishermen who want to catch the fish, now you want us to go out of water, it's a certain death. So Rabbi Akiva again was comparing, comparing water not just to a, as a physical source of life but also as an emotional and spiritual source of life. But how do I get this water? There is speaking to a rock, and there is hitting a rock. And it's a completely different type of water. And Moshe chose at that moment not to speak to the rock. He chose to strike the rock. And when he strikes the rock, our sages tell us, something fundamentally changed. It's not the same water that they got. They got a different type of water. And as a result of this type of water, everything changed. Or as the way the Zoyar puts it, if he spoke to the rock, all the debates wouldn't exist. Exertion and learning wouldn't exist. And nobody would even need somebody else as a teacher. 
Why? Because I would have that inner awareness directly from inside, intimately. The splintering of the information causes a whole different type of reality, where there's exertion, where there's debate. What does, what does all of this mean? Words, words, by definition, contain and capture an external dimension of a person's life. Think about it. If somebody were to ask you to talk about the weather, to talk about uh, summer plans, to talk maybe about politics or a shev- making a sheva brachas, to talk about exterior design or interior design, to talk about concepts you're comfortable with or you know about, so people can talk about things for hours. If somebody comes over to you and says, can you describe to me your innermost self? Can you describe to me your core? Can you describe to me your three profoundest emotions? Even if you're ready to be honest with the person, you'll see most people will struggle to find the words. Why? Some people could talk about sports or politics for eight hours without stopping. There's rabbis who give sermons and they go and go and go and go and go and go and go. Look who's talking. Somebody once introduced a speaker. He said, this speaker doesn't need an introduction. He needs an ending. Medet and that and that and that and that and that nonstop. Suddenly I ask a person, okay, so tell me, what is the deepest part of your life? What makes you tick? What scares you most? What makes you most happy? Who are you? <laughs> I don't know what to say. Why not? It's not because it's not deep. It's because words are containers. Words are limiting. Words are powerful. But words structure everything. That's the beauty of words. Words are building blocks. Right? Right? You have word smiths, just like you have goldsmiths and silversmiths. You know how to build a structure with words. Great writers do that. Great orators do that. You take words, you take letters, the same letters like somebody else, but you build them, you weave them into sentences and paragraphs. And then chapters, whether it's in verbal communication or even more in writing. But all words, by definition, capture a subject or a feeling, and they contain them. They put them into what's called a keli, a box, a vessel. Those vessels are illuminating and bright, but they're also limiting. And that's why there are many experiences in life, they call today them pre-verbal. What are pre-verbal experiences? Experiences that we have no words for, especially experiences that we experienced pre our ability to be able to articulate things in words and compartmentalize them in words. And therefore, words will not help me access them. Because they didn't go in through words, they're not going to come out through words. Ideas and feelings that I access through words, I can talk about them. They have the context of words, they have been defined by words. But deeper layers of the self, especially from childhood and early on in childhood, are called pre-verbal. So they're ingrained in a very, very deep part of a person's soul in a person's mind, in a person's psyche, and words will not do them justice. I may not even know about them in a way that I can articulate it in words. So it's not that I don't want to talk about it or that I don't experience it, but it's not something that words can capture. So words are very powerful, but by definition, words are limiting. Moshe Rabbeinu told Hashem right when he met him, Loi ish dvarim anoichi. I am not a man of words. It's hard for me to speak. On a literal level, it's Moshe had a stutter, or Moshe had a speech impediment, or Moshe didn't have the language, or Moshe had a hard time speaking. There's different interpretations. On a deeper level, what it means is that Moshe Rabbeinu was in touch with a level of reality that is deeper than being articulated in words. When we say talk is cheap, (laughs) words are cheap, I'm not referring here cheap in the sense that a person is not sincere or a person is not authentic. But what it means is that words by definition can pay, pay just, can, can, can display 
and pay justice to a part of ourselves that is more external, a part that's accessible to me, and it's accessible to me in a way that I can talk about it, I can analyze it, I can dissect it. So when Hashem says, speak to the rock and let it give the water, He's really telling Moshe Rabbeinu, I want to give them this direct water, smooth water, clean water, pure water that comes from speaking. It's the wisdom that can come through speaking, through words, through listening, and through communicating. This is a Torah of clarity, a Torah of light, a Torah of life, a Torah where there's a certain powerful and profound simplicity in a very, very good way. Moshe Rabbeinu decides to hit the rock. What does hitting a rock mean? He's looking for a different level of water. He's looking for a level of water that he can't get through words. He's looking for a level of water that is much, much deeper than words. So Moshe doesn't even speak. He does an action. It's a completely different dimension of wisdom, of inspiration, of truth that comes out. What, what, talking will get me to the surface of things. What about the inaccessible parts of myself? We all have parts of ourselves that we can talk about. But we all have parts of ourselves that we can't talk about. First of all, we may not know what to say. We may not even know it to talk about it. And even if we have some inkling, there's no clarity there to the point that I can talk about it, I can write about it. <laughs> you know, for a whole generation, for a century, talk therapy was a very, very big thing. It's still a big thing. And it was the concept of helping people talk about, process, information, emotions, and talk about it, and give it meaning, and give it structure, and put it in context, and explain the background. More and, 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 and there's tremendous value in that. The, Gemara, the Pasuk says, belev ish When you have anxiety, you should talk about it. And Chazal give two interpretations. Yischena either means Yischena medaito, or Yischena laacherim. You should remove it from your mind, or you should talk about it to others. And the two are probably connected, because by talking about it and processing it, I can actually work it through and not remain stuck there. So there's obviously a tremendous value in people articulating their emotions and trying to make sense out of it. The whole institution of CBT, of cognitive behavioral therapy, and all of its branches and all of its manifestations and all of the different aspects of therapy are focused on a form of analysis, on a form of communication, on a form of talk. So it's powerful and beneficial. But we're learning every week, every day I should say, more and more that all conversations, as authentic as they are, have very, very profound limitations. And it's important to understand those limitations. Because if I'm suffering from a trauma that occurred to me in my youth, especially in my earliest years, or a series of them, developmental trauma or one event or major events or even not major events but a series of events that included you know emotional neglect or or I was didn't feel safe or secure or seen or soothed or or misunderstood whatever it is it affects a space in my primal brain that is deeper than words so now you're talking to me from a place of a verbal self and you want me to articulate it in words I can't. I have no words for it. Words are too poor. They're simply, they have no access to that space inside of me. H how do I even find out about that space? This is where words completely fall short. In Allah, we have a concept in Kashrus called Kiboiloi Kachpoltoi. The way something goes in, that's the way it goes out. When you have to kasher dishes, let's say for Pesach or if something is not kosher, right? You always have to ask yourself, how did the non-kosher flavor get into the pot? 
Was it cold water? Was it hot water? Was it a barbecue? Because Kabbalah, the way it was absorbed, that's the way it's going to be extricated. Why is this true in chemistry and kashrus? Because it's true psychologically. The way something goes in, that's the way it's going to go out. If it went in through words, if I'm 40 years old and you told me something that insulted me, it went in through words. I gave it words. I can spit it out through words. If I was two years old, one years old, three years old, even five, six, seven years old, didn't necessarily go in through words. Especially the younger a person is, the more pre-verbal, the whole boiler was a different experience. So now the toy, the spinning it out, is a completely, completely different experience. It didn't enter my system through words, so I need tools to get to my subconscious self, my pre-verbal self, my primal self, my amygdala, the stem of my brain, where things are encoded very, very deep, emotions, uh, fears, insecurities, uh, uh, brokenness, uh, shame, in such a deep space, and I don't even have uh, the regular kalim. Let's talk about it. That's where people don't realize the limits the, the words can do. It. And that's why more and more tools are being developed, literally, as I speak. But in recent years and decades, in order to be able to access those layers of self. Major successful forms of therapy, for example, is somatic therapy. What's somatic? Somatic doesn't deal with words. The body keeps the score. It's dealing literally with the body. The body knows everything. And it's literally a form of not beating the body, not striking the body as striking the body, but yeah, touching different parts, not through words. <laughs> All f- different forms of energy healing, different forms of healing that deal with the nervous system or deal with subconscious memory, things... Uh, EMDR or somatic or nerve, all these types of forms, there's many, I'm just, I'm not mentioning, I'm, I'm not an expert in them, but some of you are very well familiar and we have even some people trained in various therapies. There's also different, different types of uh, forms of healing medicines, therapies, and they're designated on one thing. They're designated towards one goal, towards touching a much deeper layer of self that is hidden beneath the surface and where words really, really fall short. Where did all this begin? It began with Moshe Rabbeinu, <laughs> the rock, <laughs> the rock. I am a rock. Everyone is a rock. <laughs> Not everyone. Some people are. <laughs> but there's a rock. There's a rock in a person. There's also water inside the rock. If you take the word Sela, the Be'er Mayim Chavis, take the word Sela, look at this. Sela is three letters, Samach, Lam, and Ayin. If you spell out the word Samach, Samach is Samach, Mem, Chav. Samach. Right, spell out, write, write out, or pronounce it, Samach, right? Samach, 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 Mem, Chav. What's the middle letter of Samach? Mem. Go to the Lamed. Lamid, Lamid, Lamid Mem Dalid. What's the middle letter? Mem. Now let's go to Ayin. That's the third one. Samach Ayin. How do you spell Ayin? Ayin, 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 Yud Nun. What's the middle letter? Yud. Very good. So we see we have a Mem and a Mem and a Yud. That's Mayim. So what does that mean? That means Sel is a rock. But if you go inside the rock, <laughs> If you go inside, if you go to the core, if you go to the inner letter, you're going to find Mayim. You're going to find Mem and Yud and Mem. That's what's Sela. For that, you have to have the right Ayin. You have to be able to have the right eye, the right perspective, the right glasses, <laughs> the right prism, the right vantage point, the right microscope or telescope. But I have to be able to have that Ayin because at the surface, it's just hard. There's no water here. This is dry. This is tough. <laughs> this is harsh. This is cold. It's a rock. A rock feels no pain and an island never cries. Or so it seems. Or so it seems. Because if you dig a little deeper, the cellar has a lot of mayim in it. It has a lot, a lot of tears. And it has a lot of blood. So there's the water I can extract from words. There's water where words fail. I can't get it through words. 
And Moshe Rabbeinu wants to give his people that water. He wants to give the water that words cannot access. In other words, a whole deeper layer of self, which is much deeper than verbal communication, much deeper than articulation. Because remember, words are amazing, but they're finite. That's what a sentence is. And that's why when you're very, very emotional, and I say, what are you feeling? I don't know. Why can't you tell me what you're feeling? It's not because you don't want to. I'm not talking about if you don't feel comfortable with the person. You may feel very comfortable. You trust the person. But you can't even tell yourself what you're feeling. And this is what creates sometimes a lot of complexity because remember, any emotion that we never had words for growing up, what do we have to do with this emotion? <laughs> huh? So you name it. And what if you can't name it? So either you're very, very embarrassed by it, extremely embarrassed by it, or you give it the wrong name, <laughs> or you give it the wrong name, or you work very hard to make believe it doesn't exist. And all of these have serious consequences as we get triggered with these same emotions growing up, because I don't have a name for it, or whatever I don't have a name for is very scary, especially as a child. You know, if I could have a name for it, it could be predictable. But some things we can't name, and there was nobody there to give it a name. So if somebody experienced something very emotionally devastating, and there was somebody to give it a name, there's almost like a certain definition that I can deal with, I have a relationship with. If there was no name given for it, and I don't even, I'm not even in an, at an age where I can give it a name, so what happens to it? It remains nameless. But you know what it means it remains nameless? It remains present all the time in every part of my being. It doesn't have context. That's why real trauma doesn't have a time and doesn't have a place. It exists in all times. It exists in all places. Because it doesn't have a time and a place. It never had a name. To access that is very, very deep. And to access that requires tremendous amounts of empathy and very, very deep awareness of the whole reality of the self that pre-exists names. You understand what I'm talking about? Because I'm talking about things I shouldn't be talking about, you realize, right? That's the problem of every class, huh? It's like when you don't have a diagnosis, you don't do yes. So you want to yeah. it. Yes, right, right. A diagnosis words. contains, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So words are very precious, they're containers. Now sometimes they do an amazing job. They, are, they always put it into a context, they always limit it. It'll, beco it'll become clear in a few moments. What does Hashem tell Moshe? You want to strike the rock? Strike. You're not going into Eretz Yisrael. <laughs> Why? Because I want to give them their deepest waters? So that's another explanation. I said in the beginning that different years we do different interpretations. Today we're doing another one. They're all connected, but, but this is another angle. It's not a punishment. It's actually a direct consequence. A result, yeah. A result. And as we will see, Moshe, till his last breath, was trying to fight this result in a very good way. But what's the connection? What's the connection of hitting a rock? Oh, you're not going into Eretz Yisrael. Yan lo yeh mantem bi What does this really mean? What does all of this mean? I'm struggling with words here. You'll, you'll understand in a moment why. <laughs> one of the most, uh, one of the most, I would say, painful, maybe tragic truths about life, and I'm calling it painful and tragic, even though it's a truth about life, is that. It's the confrontation of people with darkness that allows them to discover their deepest waters, their deepest wisdom. You know, once in a while you meet a person and the person has a special halo, is that the word? A light around, a light around them, an aura, a halo. You speak to them, or you listen to them, and you right away sense 
that there's a special light here. There's a gem here. There's just, you feel a certain, let's, a sincerity, uh, no pettiness, uh, no ego, uh, no insecurities, no covering up. Something very, very real, very, very authentic. There's like a certain maturity, a depth. Somebody once said, you know, life is like a tale of two mountains. We climb up the first mountain in life. The first mountain is very much about success, whatever success means in that culture. Different cultures have different definitions of success. But I climb that mountain and I work hard and I get to the top of the mountain. Maybe I get to the top, maybe I get close to the top, maybe I'm trying to get to the top. And that's a mountain where the word is success. The word is I want to fit in. I want to make it. <laughs> I want to be a success story. Again, whatever success means in that particular world, it could be, it could be good, good forms of success. At some point in life, many people fall off that mountain into a cliff. Either it happens simply because of experience. Sometimes it happens because of children make us smarter. Sometimes it happens from a difficult, difficult challenges, mental, psychological, emotional, spiritual, family, marital. It can happen through loss, illness, chas v'shalom, or the various challenges. And I fall off into a cliff. And then I start climbing a second mountain. <laughs> the second mountain looks very different than the first mountain. The second mountain is never about social conformity. It's never about fitting in. It's never about what this one is going to say, what that one is going to say, what this yenta's opinion is, what that yenta's opinion is. It's never anymore about impressing this one or fitting into a mold or being yotze or being afraid. It's like a person almost finds an inner calling directly from Hashem and you just know you don't have time for anything else. I don't live anymore in a world of competitiveness and frustration and resentment and falsehood and, and pettiness and facades. It's a very, very deep place of authenticity. There are noble souls who climb that second mountain just instinctively. But generally, there's a huge amount of people who only start climbing the second mountain once they have fallen off the first mountain. Um, somebody once asked me, it was a sad question to hear. This person is in recovery for many years, and they go to 12-step programs every day. Every day, they have to. If not, they surrender to disease. And this person asked me, he said, why is it that when I come to shul, I don't feel that spirituality that I feel at these meetings? And I said to him, I'll be honest with you, I'll tell you why. I said, God is present everywhere, but there's only one condition, there's no ego. If there's an ego, God's light is eclipsed. The Gemara says in Saita, Hashem says, I could live everywhere besides under the same roof like with an arrogant person. I can't live there, sorry. <laughs> and there's a reason for it. Because by definition, Hashem means oneness, organic oneness. Arrogance is detachment from oneness. So I said, in the 12-step meeting, every person who's there, their lives have been shattered. Their egos have crumbled. They have all been brought to their knees. They have all done things that destroyed themselves or their loved ones. And they're trying to repair. When you walk into that room, there's no ego. <laughs> there is vulnerability. There is rawness because of the pain that they went through. I said, unfortunately, Lahavdal, you walk into Shul, you can't say that always. <laughs> there's sometimes a lot of ego. People protecting themselves. People wanting to fit in, people looking a certain way, acting a certain way, smiling a certain way. And wherever there is protective gears, there's no honesty, there's no authenticity. You're not going to feel the divine presence, it's just the way it is. What does it take for people's egos to be shattered? It's usually pain. It's usually pain. I was last Shabbos at Kesher Nafshi uh, Shabbaton in the Raleigh Hotel in the Catskills. So you had there around 1,500 people like six or seven hundred parents, sets of parents, and the common denominator of them were that their children are struggling seriously, emotionally, psychologically, religiously, spiritually, socially, from one extreme to another extreme. And that's what brought all their pa these parents together. So there was a parent that was there for the first time. This was the 10th convention. I think I was already, I spoke at the first one. So I had the schus to be there. And there was a parent 
who was there for the first time. And it's not easy for parents to be there the first time because they basically like, are admitting to the fact that our family is not the perfect family. And that's very hard in the Orthodox religious very from community it's very hard because our family is the perfect family you don't know that <laughs> where did you learn where did you learn your family was never perfect your family remains perfect yeah Baruch Hashem. so it's very hard for for for, for the person to come there oh and every, and we right away what is he going to say what is she going to say uh, who are they going to go back to after shabbos and say I, i'm the principal of, of the biggest school in monsi and what are they going to say that i fail you know all these hashbonas that are all normal and human, but cause us to live in a very, very uh, fake world, in a shell, not in a real world. So there was a person there who was there for the first time, and uh, they're just ex- their expression was so powerful. They said after Shabbat that I never saw so many people so honest <laughs> in a room. It was beautiful, but it was also painful. Why is everybody so honest? And the answer is because they got nothing to hide. I'm, I, I got nothing to hide. And if I, you know, there were, there were two Jews who were in a hospital. There were two people in a hospital once. They both had gout. You know what gout is? It's horrible. And uh, the doctor came in, and there was a Gentile and a Jew. So he goes to the Gentile and says, Show me the foot that has gout. He shows the foot. The doctor starts looking and poking, and you know the pain. He starts screaming. The poor Gentile starts hollering from pain for half an hour, poking a kvetch the hakt. He's hollering. He finishes with him, he goes to the Jew. He says, no, show me the foot. The Jew stretches out his foot. He starts poking and looking and digging, and the Jew is quiet. As Akrish convert, not a word. After half an hour, the doctor leaves. The Gentile looks to the Jew, and he says, I never saw a man with so much self-control in my life. How did you stay quiet for half an hour? He says, I showed him my healthy foot. You think I'm stupid? fuss? <laughs> I showed him my healthy foot. I'm not a shaita. <laughs> yeah, I eat a shakup, right? <laughs> now, we all laugh, but isn't that the story of life? <laughs> I don't want it to hurt. So I show my healthy foot. The only problem is the infection is in the other foot. So the moment a person can embrace that vulnerability, that rawness, everything changes. But it's often pain that causes me to realize I can't cope with fakeness anymore. I can't cope with cover-ups. I, I just can't cope. As long as I could cope, <laughs> I could be superficial. Some people, life has thrown such curveballs at them, they can't be superficial. They can't afford to protect themselves in the shell of an ego, of a facade. It, it's just not working for me. All the walls have come down with vengeance. And in our generation, we see it happening a lot, especially through the youth. They're challenging their parents and grandparents and systems in such profound ways that the regular methods of just do what I did, just like I did what my mother told my father told me to do, is just, it's not effective in so many ways. And people are challenged to go to a much, much deeper place. And so many traumas are coming out, which are pre-verbal. And therefore, they have to challenge me to go to my pre-verbal places and ask myself, why am I reacting in this way? And where is this hate coming from? And where is this anger coming from? And this disappointment and this rejection. It's a whole different level of self-awareness that is required when you're dealing with realities that don't work. If my car functions, I don't have to pick up the hood. If my car breaks down, I have to pick up the hood and see what's happening inside the car. My computer is functioning. I never have to open it, but if my computer crashes and there's a virus all over the place, chas v'shalom, you have to open up the computer and take it apart and find the blood in the water that's deep, deep inside. In my journeys, and I've have, I've, I have and I had the privilege of meeting many, many, many people, both in person and through correspondence. And it's even hard for me to say it in words. I'm struck, you see, I'm struggling for words with this class. And usually I don't struggle for words so badly. Uh, 
it's always awe-inspiring to me to speak to people who have been through the ringer and have been through challenges that nobody can even imagine sometimes, that people can be through these challenges or people should experience these types of struggles or perpetrators should do these types of things to people. And in the depth of their pain and sometimes their horrors, there is such a light, there is such a sweetness, there's such a purity and authenticity that comes through because there's no vanity, there's no futility, there's not an iota, there's not a scent, there's not an iota of arrogance, of haughtiness, of pettiness, of smallness, of cheap talk or cheap shots. Everything is at stake. They, their, their souls are on their sleeve. And it only came from profound, profound challenge. It's because nothing worked for them. And therefore the protective gear and the bulletproof vest that I may wear with a nice tie and a nice suit and come to shul and I look like a mensch, right? And <laughs> they're, like, they're like beyond that. And because all the walls were shattered, they had to go to a much, much deeper place. So here is what happens. Moshe strikes the rock. He doesn't speak to the rock. He wants to get and wants to give people their deepest, deepest, deepest waters. Hashem says, but Moshe, that means you don't go in Teretz Yisrael. What's the connection? If Moshe would take in the Jewish people Teretz Yisrael, as Darizal often says, there would be no struggle. There would be no darkness. There would be no imperfection. The synergy, that's a good word, the synergy of Moshe and Eretz Yisrael, the synthesis of these two lights would create the perfection of a messianic era that would descend immediately and the arch of history would be complete. What's the problem with that? <laughs> Seems good to me. There's no problem with that. But here is the tragedy I'm talking about, about life. And that is the path to discover people's deepest light comes through darkness. It comes through failure. It comes through the lack of clarity. It comes through confusion. The path to my inner light always leads through my skeletons, my darkness, my ghosts. Why is that? <laughs> Great question. I don't know if that I have an answer. But I do know something fascinating that the Zoyar says in the introduction. If you look in your source sheets on the bottom, and it's quoted in Tanya chapter, then, Reb Chia wanted to ascend to the heavenly shrine of Reb Shimon ben Yechai and he heard a voice. Whoever has not converted the darkness of the world and of their soul into light and transformed bitterness into sweetness cannot enter into this chamber. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means that there's a certain depth of awareness and a depth of light I will only encounter if I could confront my blockages and my darkness and my bitterness and transform it. If Moshe Rabbeinu comes into Eretz Yisrael, as you see in the previous source, it says, Skenim, they said about Moshe Rabbeinu, Pnei Moshe ke Pnei Chama, Pnei Yeshua ke Pnei Levona. The face of Moshe is as bright as the face of the sun. The face of Yeshua is, the fa is like the face of the moon. If Moshe goes into Eretz Yisrael, the sun goes into Eretz Yisrael. If Yeshua takes them into Eretz Yisrael, the moon goes into Eretz Yisrael. What's the difference of the sun and the moon? You got it. <laughs> this is the difference. The light of the sun eradicates darkness. Today, uh, <laughs> but it still eradicates darkness. The light of the moon does not eradicate darkness. The light of the sun is steady, unwavering. It confidence where it shines, there is light. 
and you see where to go and you don't trip and there's no debate. This is right, this is left. This is a ditch. It's clear. It's articulated. They say that in Chelem, they once had a debate. What is more important, the sun or the moon? They debated for seven days. And then they decided the moon is much more important than the sun because the sun shines during daytime when you don't need it. <laughs> the moon shines when you need it because it's dark outside. The moon is shaky. The moon waxes. The moon wanes. The moon is, doesn't have the stability. The moon flashes in and out. And then the moon disappears for a couple of days and it's invisible. It's Bechlal in a depression. There's a reason we call lunatics lunatics based on the lunar cycle. There's a lack of, of stability and, and consistency. There are solar systems and there are lunar systems. And it's great when they marry each other. And that's when you have to have a leap year and Ibriyar. So in the beginning of the month, it's invisible. In the middle of the month, it's like, wow, geschmack. At the end of the month, it's like, again, waning and about to disappear. And it never removes the darkness. It shines inside the darkness. There's something very beautiful, uh, poetic, about moonlight sitting at a bonfire and singing camp songs <laughs> to the light of the moon. And that's why Pnei Moshe is Pnei Chama, Pnei Shoka, Pnei Levana. When Yeshua takes the Jewish people into Israel, Yeshua was a student of Moshe, but he was not Moshe. So when Yeshua takes in the people to Israel, it's a different experience. The Beis Hamikdash is built and destroyed. A second Beis Hamikdash is built and destroyed again. With Moshe Rabbeinu, it says, the Megal Amukah says, and it says in many Svarim, they couldn't have been Chorben. There wouldn't have been destruction. But if I don't destroy my own soul, if I don't experience my failure, can I experience the light that comes from the deepest place of the soul? So he tells, Hashem tells Moshe, you struck the rock. I get it. Of course, you can't go into Eretz Yisrael now. This is the idea of the Zayar, striking the rock created exertion and learning. What does it mean exertion? I look at information and I don't know what it says. So I have to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And what happens? I get to a much deeper place. You know, it says Moshe struck the rock twice. So it says in Mepharshim, Talmud Bavli, Talmud Yerushalmi. <laughs> There's two Gemaras. The difference is, the Gemara says about your Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, B'machshakim ha'yishivani. Yirmiya Hanavi says, I have been placed in darkness. Says the Gemara, Zeh Talmud shel Bavel. The Babylonian Talmud is called darkness. The Gemara of Eretz Yisrael is much more direct and succinct and it comes to conclusions fast. The Babylonian Gemara, and that's what your boys are doing for like the last 12 years, every page is another page saturated with debates and questions and refutations. There's an idea and then the idea is challenged and then there's an answer and the answer is challenged. And sometimes you can have 10, 20, 30 times and it's challenged more and more and more and more. Could you give me the water? There's no water. You got to strike and work and work and work and work. But at the end, it's a different level of water. <laughs> it's like the water that comes from under the earth, the wellsprings are much more fresh than the water you're going to find in a lake or a pond or a river or a canal or an ocean, or even rainwater. Rainwater comes from the clouds from heaven. It never has the freshness and the clarity like the mayim chayim of the paraduma, the living wellsprings that come under the earth. Why? The answer is because the water that comes from under the ground struggles its way through the gide arts. It's called the veins of the earth, and it receives all the nutrients of the rocks and the gravel and the soil and the earth. And it struggles its way, and that's why there's nothing as fresh as spring water to quench a thirsty soul. But that's the water that struggled, and it was buried and deep, and you had to dig and dig and dig, and you had to literally strike. You can't just talk to it and get the water. It's a different level of water. There's so much more nutrients because it had to work through its way. That which I have to struggle for, I own. And that which I struggle to find the light that I had to work for because I had to work through darkness, it gets all the nutrients of the darkness. That's what Rashbi is saying. You see, every, every experience that a person has, 
every blockage a person has is hiding a very, very deep light. And sometimes the deeper the pain, it's only because the deeper the light inside of it. That's what caused so much pain. And this is a very, very fascinating and also difficult paradox. Speak about that child. When that child closed up, when that child disassociated, when that child disconnected, when that child went offline because of what happened to that child, one time or many times, what were they trying to protect? They were trying to protect their light. But their light now is covered over by layers and layers of disassociation and disconnect. So how am I going to access their light? Only if I work through those layers. For this I have to strike the rock because that's where all the light is. The light is deposited beneath layers and layers of darkness. When I'm confronting my darkness, it's a direct path to my light. And that's why when a person has pain, and when a person is experiencing confusion, and machloikas, what does machloikas mean? I have no clarity. I don't know. I don't know. This rock is so confusing. I don't know. It's like a maze. Life becomes a maze. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know if I'm coming. I don't know what to think. I have no words. From speaking to the rock, that would have never happened. There would have been a different dimension of water. This rock, this rock, to find the water is a maze. And it's hidden behind layers and layers. And that's why there's so much splintering. And yet, Moshe was giving this to the Jewish people because he wanted, he wanted people not to live on the surface. Moshe wanted to give people the second mountain, not the first mountain. Moshe wanted to give people their deepest, deepest, deepest truth that is hidden that is hidden behind layers and layers so that's what we explained because you have to feel this experientially it's not so much about words if Moshe comes into Eretz Yisrael there's no darkness so it's a direct result it's the, it's the darkness, the failure, the struggle that allows me to go to a much deeper place inside of me and find that water. It's precisely that. We sometimes look at our lives with a lot of regret. If I only would have known this and I only would have known this, if I would have had this and I would have had that, things would have been so much better the water would be so much clearer. My family would be in a different place. I would be in a different place. This one would be in a different place. That would be in a different place. And there may be a lot of truth to that. And we sometimes live in a lot of remorse and a lot of regret. If only. If only. But there's a much deeper perspective. And that is, it's precisely this journey with my mistakes with my errors, with my stumbling blocks, with my failures, and with the pain that I dealt with which brought me to this place. That doesn't make the journey easy, but it allows me to get in contact with a different level of truth, with a different level of wisdom, with a different level of self, and therefore with a different level of God, of godliness. The second mountain versus the first mountain. It's precisely my mistakes and my struggles. The Gemara says, Where the Baal Tshuva stands, that Tzadik could never stand. Why? Just because he's a good guy? <laughs> That's not fair. But it's precisely that. Because it's my failures and my darkness that causes me and challenges me to dig and dig much deeper. It causes me to shed layers that I would never have to shed. And furthermore, number two, it causes me to find the secret inside the darkness, what it's holding on to, what it's protecting. What water is stored deep, deep, deep inside that's protected by layers and layers of fear and trauma. But there's an infinite light there, and I'll tell you something else. 
the greater the blockage, usually the greater the light. Churchill said during a time of war, truth is so precious we protect it with bodyguards of lies. The more bodyguards, the more truth. The more walls of protection, it's because the child knew that this has to be protected under all costs. So I'm seeing walls and walls and walls and walls and I'm, dis I'm delegitimizing myself. It's really only because the light there is too precious. And the three-year-old knew that. The three-year-old was brilliant. And therefore he or she created protections that are unbelievably powerful. And if I have the courage to look there, and it's not easy because the protectors will always say this is a death sentence. If you walk into this place, there are, this is a minefield. You're going to die. You're going to explode. That's its only way to, to, to lie. <laughs> that's what a klipa is. That's what a shell is. But if I have the courage, and that's the courage Moshe Rabbeinu gave the Jewish people at that, de that day, to be able to find that water, to be able to avoid the fear of striking those layers and protectors that block and extracting the pnimius to the pnimius, the core of the core, which only comes through tremendous exertion and unclarity and at a time where I don't know, I don't know. And the reason I don't know is because there's no clarity, because I'm reaching a place that is so deep that clarity has no room there because it's beyond clarity, it's infinity. And infinity, I can never wrap my brain around. I can't control it. I can't say, ah, this is what it is. It's opening myself up to mystery, and that takes tremendous humility and tremendous vulnerability. It's an internally experienced world. But that also means Moshe doesn't come into Eretz Yisrael. Because when he comes into Eretz Yisrael, the face of the sun, everything is clear. And this is the clarity that comes through unclarity. It's the verdict that comes through debate. It's the answers that come through questions. Eli Wiesel once told a story that when he was young, there was a fellow in his city who was a mavakish. He was always searching for truth. And any person who came to town, any great man, he would always say, why, why, why did God create the world? Why am I here? And once he said, this bit sadik came to town to Sigit, and this young man came to him and said, tell me why was the world created? Why are we here? What's the purpose of all of it? And this Rebbe gave him a smack. He says, why are you giving me a smack? He says, why do you want to ruin such a good question with a superficial answer? It's the answers that divide us. It's the questions that unite us. If you think about it, <laughs> what divides people? Answers. What unites people? Questions. So this is what the Zayar says. The qu think about that. The, <laughs> the question. It's... It <laughs> He didn't say a name, he just told a story. Huh? <laughs> Reb Nachman of Breslov writes, we say in, we say in the Kedusha, in the Kesa, we say, right? Where is the place of his glory? And you know what he says, Aye. The question of where, that's Mekayim Kvayde, that's the place of his glory. The Aye itself. Because it's that Aye that allows me to transcend my ego, my smugness, my religious smugness, my complacency. It brings me into Mekayim Kvayde. That mystery is extremely, extremely ennobling because it allows me to touch truth, to touch God yet in a much deeper, deeper way beyond the constructs of my words and of my brain. But now, Moshe confronts Hashem. And he says, I want to go into Eretz Yisrael. Not because he didn't get it. Because Moshe Rabbeinu says, I want to give them this water and I want to go into Eretz Yisrael. You told me I can't go into Eretz Yisrael. And we explained why. Because if Moshe goes into Eretz Yisrael, there's clarity. Purpose is revealed. Oneness is manifest. The sun is shining. There's no failure. There's no darkness. There's no struggle. I don't destroy myself. Nobody can destroy me. 
And to get this type of water, this water always comes through failure. It always comes through darkness. There's a certain confusion that I deal with, that I have to confront. Moshe says, I want the cake, and I want to eat the cake too. You're God, you created the system. So why can't we have the deepest, deepest, deepest waters without the deepest struggles? I want to go into Eretz Yisrael. We'll have the face of the sun. And we'll still have the deepest water. And you see, Moshe didn't stop praying for this. Till the end of his life, it says he weaved 515 prayers to ask this question. It wasn't just a question, I want to go into Eretz Yisrael. Why? Because the flaffle and the shwam in Eretz Yisrael? Or because the beautiful sights? Gemara, Eretz Yisrael is beautiful. Like the Gemara says, Lechel mepirul is metuva. He wanted the fruits of Eretz Yisrael. It's nice to have the fruits of Eretz Yisrael, no question. It's not even only Moshe wanted the holiness of Eretz Yisrael. It was something much deeper than that. Moshe Rabbeinu, as the faithful shepherd of the Jewish people, says, I know I split the rock. I know I fragmented the rock. I know that the Torah pre that was a unified Torah, a holistic Torah. Everything was clear. Everything had its place. And now it's a Torah where there's a lot of question and therefore confusion. Think about yourself what that means. I could look at my life and there's a clear map. This is where you go. This is where you don't go. It's clear. Everything is clear. Every child is born with a manual. This is how you treat him. This is how you treat her. Instead, it's a Torah where I ask questions and I find an answer and then I ask another question. And every day, the Baal Shem Tov said, every question I have an answer for. But every answer I have another question for. <laughs> what does that mean? It means what was today an answer becomes tomorrow a question. The next day there's an answer for that, but the next day that grows into another question. Because with more awareness and with more layers of the onion peeled, the journey to infinity comes through shedding layers and layers and more layers and more layers and more layers and finding that truth. So Moshe Rabbeinu comes to Hashem and he says, I understand when I encounter pain, when I encounter trauma, it's not easy, but it's my path to my ultimate self. I get it. It's an alarm clock that allows me to wake up. But Moshe, as a faithful leader, refuses to accept this. At the end of his life, he testifies how he never stopped pleading with the Rebbeinu Shalom to go into Eretz Yisrael. Why? Moshe was confronting this very notion in life. Which notion? This truth, this, this maxim, this uh, axiom, this paradigm. To reach the deepest light, you have to face the deepest adversity. Is this a true statement or is it a false statement? It's sad, but it's often a true statement. Maybe not for everybody, but at least for many people. Why could the people not experience the essence of wisdom, the essence of inspiration, the essence of Torah, the essence of life, the essence of themselves, and the essence of truth without pain? Why can people find their true meaning and calling, climb their second mountain with light and clarity? Why do I need to break down all my layers of ego to find the truth? Why can't I climb the second mountain initially? Why can't I climb it with myself, with my resources, with my conscious brain? Why is it? Why is it that any person, any person, I would say, <laughs> there's a famous expression of Rabbi Yochanan and Gemara, Meseches Menach, says people are like olives, and the Jewish people are like olives. You want to get the oil? You press the olive. You want to look at the olive? Great, you don't get the oil. You'll see the people that touch humanity most, the people that touch you most, the people that you feel you could receive from most, the people you trust most, 
The people that come across with the deepest authenticity or truth are people that have been challenged very, very profoundly and worked through a lot of, lot of things. And it's always commensurate. Again, there are exceptions. There are souls that are just born, you know, noble and angelic. And they inspire more from above. But to inspire from within. So you could look at a person's eyes and you could see how much pain they work through. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, why does it have to be this way? And what's the end of the story? The end of the story is Moshe never stops disagreeing with Hashem about this point. Sure, logically, I could give the explanation. When I'm not broken, my ego is deflated. Is, is Sorry, inflated. When the ego breaks, it becomes deflated, and I can go to a deeper place. I get it. I understand that in the darkness, there's a very deep treasure hidden. I get it. But Hashem created logic. Hashem created a system. So He could create a system that I reach profoundity amidst serenity. Truth amidst tranquility. The deepest self and the deepest waters through easy and smooth words. So Moshe doesn't stop fighting, so to speak, with Hashem. And he says, let me go into the land. I want to go in with my people. Let me illuminate their way. Let them uncover the deepest parts of themselves without getting hurt. Let them see the face of the sun in Eretz Yisrael. Till the end, he quarrels with Hashem about this, just like Avram did, just like Moshe did in the beginning of his journey in Mitzrayim. Just like Eoiv would do, just like Yermia would do, just like Yeshaya would do, just like David HaMelech would do. Moshe wants to enter into the land of Eretz Yisrael. What's Hashem's answer to Moshe? He doesn't give him an answer. He just says, stop talking to me about this. Here we come to the ultimate mystery of creation, Chukas. The ultimate mystery of creation is the unknowable reality of reality. The unknowable reality of God. In other words, the ultimate reason why Hashem made the world the way He made it, this remains a chukah. It remains something that the finite mind of the human, even the greatest human, grapples with. And even the person who sees through so many other things, ultimately, if Hashem made the system, He could have made a different system. Even logically, he created logic. Logic itself is not logical. <laughs> logic itself is a creation. You could have created a different form of logic. Time is created, space is created, logic is created. Strife gives birth to insight and growth. Why? So there's answers. But why? So you'll say, because. And then you'll say, but why? And you'll say, why not? <laughs> and then you'll go to a deeper why and why and why. We continue the battle. We, we forge. We forge ahead into the darkness. But until the moment of redemptiveness, until the moment of Geula, Moshe's question and prayer remains as powerful as Hashem's response. The deepest water they're going to get. <laughs> the deepest water they will have access to. The deepest water that comes from mistakes the world is going to experience. And that's why by definition this has to happen through Moshe, not through Hashem. If Hashem tells Moshe, hit the rock, <laughs> then it's fulfilling a commandment. That's not failure. This water always comes through the struggle, through failure, through darkness. It comes through Moshe, not through Hashem, so to speak. That's the ultimate truth. God almost says, there's something that you have to discover. I can't give it to you. This is something where you become a partner in creation. It's almost like, think about this, as it says in one place, the neshama is a piece of Hashem. So it's really one. Right? And then Hashem takes a part of Himself and He sends it down into the darkness. And the Gemara says that it's a point where Hashem says, My children have become victorious over me. The, the, the Gemara says, My children have, have won the war. It's almost like Hashem says, I'm going to stay 
in the holy spaces. You are going to have the courage to go into a place of darkness and transform it into light. And that's where the child gives something to the father that the father himself didn't have. Nitzchuni, bonai nitzchuni. The child himself or herself does something that the parent themselves didn't do. It's like the soul has this courage to tell Hashem, I'll be fine. I'll be able to find the truth in the darkness. In the summer we have a month, Menachem Av. What does Menachem Av mean? Usually the father comfort, but really Menachem Av means you comfort the father. There's also a comfort that the child brings to the father that the child says, I'll be fine. I can do this. I got it covered. I got you back. The soul is so infinite, it's so powerful that it brings and it reveals to Hashem something that Kevayachal is deeper than what was revealed before creation. What was revealed before creation was light. And then the soul comes and reveals the deepest light that comes from the darkness. This is only the soul that does this. So, the child revealed something in the father that the father, so to speak, didn't experience in a revealed way in himself. If we could speak that way, my children were victorious. Like we give back a gift. The gift of transformation. This comes from Moshe. So when you ask, why, but why, but why, 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 why? There's, there's, there's a space of mystery. There's a space of mystery. Somebody who says, I'm going to figure it all out. I'm going to get this whole picture straight. I'm going to have it clear. By definition, you're not dealing with this level of reality. This level of reality throws people into a place of deep confusion. And deep, deep questions. And at the end we say, there's a mystery here. And even Moshe Rabbeinu himself, till the last moment, says, but why? Let's do it differently. And Hashem never gives him an explanation. Not because he's trying to keep Moshe in the dark, because this is something beyond the realm of explanation. This is something beyond the realm of logic. This is something beyond the realm that my brain will be able to grasp it. It says when Mashiach comes and the ultimate light will be revealed in the most revealed way, the infinite light will dwell in the finite containers of the world. It's called Eiris de Tayu Bekelem de Tikon. There will be able to be the fusion of the two, the deepest waters, and Moshe Rabbeinu will come into Eretz Yisrael. Only because of the Avaida over thousands of years of the world and of humanity and of the Jewish people. So that the ultimate fusion will be, that's why the Navi says, Mashiach comes, Oit Hashem ki to me. We're going to thank Hashem for everything. There'll be a clarity that Moshe Rabbeinu will say, Ah, so now I'm coming into Eretz Yisrael. That's why I didn't go into Eretz Yisrael. But till that moment, that struggle remains. Moshe wants to give the depth. He gives the depth. He wants to give the profoundest waters of truth, the infinite waters of truth. He also wants to come into Eretz Yisrael. He wants to have both. I want the full truth in the most revealed goodness. The Torah keeps on saying that about Moshe. Because that's what a Jewish leader does. That's what a Jewish leader is looking for. Simultaneously, Moshe also understands, or doesn't understand, that there's a mystery here, beyond. And that mystery is a mystery everybody grapples with. On one hand, you can sense, everybody could sense, that whenever I'm confronted with a trauma and a darkness, it's an invitation to deep healing. What I can't understand ultimately is, is this really how the system had to be? Does this really, really make sense? Even if it makes sense, sense itself was created. And therefore, sense itself could have been created also differently. As we approach the moments of Gaula closer and closer, though, we see a pattern emerging. And the pattern emerging is that we prepare for a time when we can reach the deepest awarenesses of life without pain. True, as long as Gaulus exists, and we're still in a Gaulus, as we all know, sadly, this paradox exists. There is deep, deep light and purpose and meaning. But the question of Aye is a very, very profound one. And the question of why is a very profound one. To the point, 
that at some point we just say, I don't know. I don't know. Chukas, it's a mystery. I don't know. I don't know. Everybody knows in their own life or the family's lives or different situations. You look and the worst and the stupidest thing I can do is give explanations. Because of this, because of that, because of that. We're tempted. Jews like giving explanations. But at some point it becomes so ridiculously absurd. Can I just remain present in the face of mystery? And that's the first thing Moshe experiences with Hashem. He sees a burning bush. It's burning and burning and burning and it's not being consumed. It's not being destroyed. And Moshe says, I want to understand. I want to understand how it works. Somebody is on fire and they're not being destroyed. And Hashem says, take your feet off. Take your shoes off your feet. This is holy soil. This is sacred soil. This is something very transcendent, very deep. At the end, Moshe will say, I want to go into Eretz Yisrael. Let's make it work in the most integrated way. Why do you need this paraduma? There's death and then we become contaminated and then there's cleansing. This whole process is so painful. And what's his answer? There's an ultimate, ultimate mystery here. This paradox lives in mystery. And I could create room for that mystery. How? Not trying to wrap my brain around it and contain it in finiteness. I could remain open to the infinity of mystery. And I also want to remain open to the fact that we're coming to a time when we don't have to experience the shattering of the self in order to open ourselves up to infinite truth. But rather, the concept of Gula, the reality of Gula is that the whole light of redemption, the infinite light of redemption, can be integrated. Integrated within the self, integrated within my identity, within my wisdom, within my heart, within the physical and material world. So if even the deepest waters demand that Moshe shouldn't come into Eretz Yisrael, there comes a time where Moshe does come into Eretz Yisrael. That's in the ultimate chibur, the ultimate fusion, where the very self has been so elevated and transformed that the very self can become a container for that which is beyond the self. The ultimate fusion of heaven and earth. And that's the experience of Gula. Everybody have a wonderful week. Thank you. And next week we're on Tuesday, 9.30 a.m. Thank you. Thank you.